your life is revealed in your death. Now, it seems like kind of a morbid way to start, but I think the, the statement is true. I'll get back to that in just a moment. Shalom, everyone. Welcome to this week's Living Torah. Uh, let me address very quickly, very, very quickly, uh, the events that are going on around us right now. Uh, I know that for many people, they're celebrating. In fact, I was told that the number one uh, search on Google right after the election results began to came, come in was, where's the nearest liquor store to me? And I guess that some were going to celebrate, others were going to mourn. Well, it, you know, whatever. But uh, I see something very good that's happening right now. And that is that people are praying. They're joining together in different places. I talked to some friends in Florida. There's a, a prayer meeting going on on, Shab on uh, Saturday mornings there. And, and this is happening all over. But what we pray is of more importance right now. Uh, I think that many people would probably be getting together and praying that their candidate would, you know, go that they would be declared and everything would be over. But I, I think that a better prayer right now is one that I'm hearing a lot of people talk about, and that is, may that which is being done in darkness be revealed in the light. Uh, there's nothing better in this time that we live in today, folks, that we could be praying is that the Father would uncover, and this is, these are words that uh, are in, in the book of Matthew, other places, that that which is being done in darkness, whether it be political, religious, and all kinds of er other areas of life, may it be brought to the light. Uh, it's a very similar prayer to a verse in Psalms. It is time for you to act, yud heh vav -he. It is time for you to act, that that he would arise onto the scene and reveal himself, not through a political candidate, but through his presence upon the earth. Okay, I want to get off of that because it's a, to me it's kind of a dead end road here. The, as I said, your, your life is revealed in your death. Let me explain that. Death is, an, a, very, is a very interesting thing to uh, if you really stop and think about it. And most people, let's face it, most people don't stop and think about it. Uh, human, humans are the only species, okay, I'm going to use that, that word, or let, let me use a different word so I don't sound Darwinist. Uh, humans are the only part of creation that we know of that has really any sense of time, that has any sense of destiny. Every other part of creation, whether it be uh, the, the very trees that are losing their leaves right now and, and will we'll come back in the spring, or um, you know, the, the animals, the, whatever, uh, they, they really don't have, that, that we know of, okay, we, they do not have any sense of time other than, well, the sun's coming up and the sun's going down and you know, if you're, uh, you know, if you're, you're most animals, you, when the sun comes up, you get up, and when the sun goes down, you go, you lay back down. If you're an owl, it's totally different, okay? But there's, there's no sense of destiny. There's no sense of that there's something more than just the day-by-day -day things of life, and this is where humankind becomes separated from the rest of creation. The tragedy is that most people don't spend much time thinking about death. And so in the process, life becomes kind of, well, whatever happens is going to happen instead of living in such a way that when you come to the end of your life, that you can look back and say it was meaningful. With the, the Torah portion this week, it talks about, it's the, the title is uh, Sarah's life, but it talks about her death. Now, there is all kinds of speculation of how Sarah died. Uh, some have said, well, that she, she got wind of, that, that Eliezer uh, probably, possibly told Sarah 
of, uh, you know, maybe there was a delay in them coming back, all kinds of, of things that have been speculated. The truth is, the Torah doesn't tell us. And I think there's a reason for that. It's proven out. I've uh, <coughs> been in ministry now for many years, uh, over 30 years. I've done countless funerals. I have no idea. Uh, I used to, in the first, you know, the first years, I kept track of funerals that I did. Uh, somewhere along the way, I, you know, I've got my my suit that I use pretty much just for weddings and funerals. And so, usually, you know, uh, some time goes by, and somebody asks me to do another wedding, another funeral, and. I reach in the vest pocket, and, and there's you know, the, the obituary from the last one that I did, okay? But I, I really don't know. But to me, funerals are an interesting place to be because it is something that, considering that every person, except for two that we know of, you know, the Scripture records, every person that's ever lived will die, has died, or, or will die, okay? It's something that we have in common. All of us have in common with, with each other in that we're going to die unless we get that, you know, change in the twinkling of the eye. And I, personally, I'm kind of holding out for that one still. But a funeral is a place that is one of the most awkward places that, that people go to. They, some of the... Some of the craziest things that I've ever heard in my life are said at funerals. Uh, you know, you someone walks up to a spouse that's just um, that's just lost their their loved one, and you know, how are you doing? Well, how do you think I'm doing? I just lost somebody I've been married to for forty years. How do you think I'm doing? Or uh, the 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 here's the one. Well, they've gone to a better place. Okay, well, that, that just really did a lot to, uh, you know, to soothe over the, the void that I'm feeling in my life. Um, here's another one. How did they die? I, I, I don't want to be, you know, I, I don't want to kind of sound a little callous here in, in what I'm saying, but that, that's about the most irrelevant question that someone can ask. Okay, I've, I've, as I've probably done, I don't know, 50, 100 funerals. I don't know. Uh, every one of them has died in a different way, but they've all died, okay? So the question, the, 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 what is being brought forth in this Torah portion is a very simple fact of life. It doesn't really matter how she died because she died. What matters is how she lived. And so the next time you're, you know, you're invited, is, is somebody dies and you go to a funeral, don't ask how they died. Ask how they lived. Because death should be a celebration of the way that a person lived, if they truly lived. And we see this in the life of Sarah. It says that Sarah lived to be 127 years old, and these were the years of Sarah's chai, of her life. Now, that word chai, you, you probably know that. We, we use the, the term like, uh, you know, to life, lachaim. Well, the word chai is, uh, uh, if you look at the translations of the word, it is not just an existence. The word is translated or, or expounded on that it's like vegetation that is growing in a garden. It's like water flowing in a river or like the springtime. So what this is saying is that Sarah's life was one of fruitfulness. It was one filled with life. Her whole life was like the spring. I think that Sarah was probably one of those people that was just, she was just fun to be around. She enjoyed life. She had difficult times, yes, as we all do. I mean, newsflash, life doesn't always go like we want it to, right? 
Look at the last couple of weeks, huh? But in the process, how do you flourish in life? I mean, when I, when I use that term flourish, let me ask you a very direct question. Are you having a difficult time flourishing with the current events that are happening around us? I know it's a personal question, and you don't have to send me an email telling me what the answer is. Um, I Listen, I got all the right cliches too, okay? God is in control. He's still on the throne. We've read the end of the book. We know how it happens. Da, 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 da. And then you wake up in the morning, and you have to deal with it, okay? So... Are, are, are any of us having a hard time kind of flourishing during this time period? As, is that a, a question that goes back to most of 2020? Or are we just existing? There's a key that's found in the word life. And that is that the, um, the, the word chai, life, is, uh, is a ket and a yod. And it's about, uh, if you look at the letter Ket, it is like a, a tent. So it's like dwelling in a tent. But, you know, you can dwell in a tent and it be very desolate. You can dwell in a tent in isolation. Uh, you can be miserable. But outside the tent is a yod. The yod is a hand. A hand from the heavens. So from our, this is the picture that it gives us is that from our tent, we need to be reaching up to his hand. Is that the same kind of a thought that goes through scripture of, uh, and is, is expounded on in uh, Luke, Luke chapter 21? Look up. When these things happen, look up. For real redemption draws near. Is it that we should not only be looking up, but reaching up? Is that what Sarah did through difficult times of her life? Sarah came to the age of 127, and she died. You know, it is a fact of life. That there is, we look at the words of Solomon, Shlomo, in Ecclesiastes. There's a time for life, and there's a time for death. Um, it is a part of life. It is something of life that most people are are. are pretty much isolated from you know you go to a store and uh and you you know you buy the the meat already packaged you don't have to see it uh hanok i was talking to hanok the other day and he says the first time he saw an animal of, of any kind being slaughtered was when he went to the samaritan village one passover they have a different calendar of course and uh, it was there that he saw this slaughter. <laughs> he said, you know, wanting to eat meat for a little while. Because up until that point, he thought that it just came in the styrofoam thing with the plastic wrapping. Well, the truth is, that's how most people go through life. Uh, we did something that many people have done in the last few months. We got chickens again. I looked out my window and they're out there. My deer feeder uh, eating corn. Well, you know. The thing is, we got 12 chickens when we, when we started, and now we have 10. Uh, we've got a hawk somewhere in the area, and I, there's no way to, it's just, it's a fact of life. I mean, it, it'd be great to, to figure out how to tell this hawk, don't come here, but the hawk has to live too. And the hawk lives by the death of something else. Okay, so with that, I just give you kind of expounding there to in the midst of where we are in the in the world are we are we considering are, are we are we flourishing with life or just existing waiting to die there's there's a lot of people that are like that uh, my wife Kathy does the the meals on wheels uh, you know another government program but there's a lot of people out there that they can't get out, they can't drive right now, they're, you know, they're scared and all this kind of stuff. And she comes home and she tells me the stories of, of all these different people and, and uh, so many of them, they're just existing. 
waiting to die. If you're drawing breath today, there's a reason. Sarah had 127 years of breathing, and then she came to the place that it was her time. And maybe there's a reason that it happened like this. Okay, Maybe <clears throat> we see Abraham living to 180 years old. Well, now, you know, he's the same, you know, this is a married couple, and, uh, you know, they've, they've both been given the hay at the end of their, their names, and they, you know, there was, there was new life breathed into Sarah, so why is it that Sarah doesn't live to the same age that Abraham does? Well, maybe there's a key here. We'll get to that in just a moment. Abram goes, Abraham goes to the place of the cave of Machpelah in Hebron, modern-day Hebron. It's, uh, it's one of three places in Scripture that has an actual biblical deed. Of course, you know, the United Nations does not in any way uh, you know, acknowledge that biblical deed, but it's there no matter what. So there's three areas in Scripture that are actually we have biblical deeds: Hebron, uh, Shechem, and the uh, the tomb of Joseph, and the Temple Mount. You can go and you can look at each one of those. Hebron is a place that is um, it's just a handful now of Jews that are surrounded by t uh, hundreds of or tens of thousands. I don't. I did not get the actual population there, but tens of thousands of Palestinians, who many of them wake up every morning with only one thought in their mind, and that is, how do we kill the Jews that are still here? The I've been there numerous times. It is a fascinating place. Uh, the cave of Machpelah, the building that is there is not really my favorite place to go because it's got a lot of religious trappings and things that are, are there. But the, the aspect of what is happening, where, what, why did Abram, Abraham go back? Why did he go there? Okay, He could have buried her pretty much anywhere in the land of Canaan he could have gone, you know, to Beit El. Uh, you know, he could have gone back up to Shechem. Various places he could have gone, but he went specifically to the cave of Machpelah, and he he asked to buy the cave and the field. It is taught, uh, you know, I we cannot we cannot prove this, but I I believe it to be pretty plausible that this is the place that was and may even still be the entrance to the Garden of Eden. Okay, some kind of a city that today is buried underground. Uh, yeah, I mean, some of the movies, think about the movies that have come out. Uh, is, are these movies based upon something that actually could be true? Well, I guess that time will tell on that one. But he, it is said that this is where Adam and Eve were buried. And so we see the patriarchs and the matriarchs uh, that are buried here at the cave of Machpelah. It is about returning to your roots. I mean, the, people do this all the time. Um, you know, you, you can be, somebody moves, you know, they grow up somewhere and there's a, a family cemetery or somewhere that your, uh, that, that your relatives, your maybe parents are buried and you move off wherever, but then you say somewhere at the end, you know, I want to be buried in that cemetery. Okay, why? It's about returning. It's, it's about connecting to where you came from. So Abraham is connecting to where he came from, and that is to be buried in the same place that possibly Adam and Eve were buried so you guys, you, you know the, the negotiations that went on about that. I'm going to move on from there. But here's, here's the, the point that I want to make. And that is, why is it that Sarah would die, uh, what is it, you know, uh, 53 years prior to 
Abraham dying. In fact, in that day, living to 127, yeah, you, you know, you weren't really up there at, at dying age. I mean, that was pretty much dying a little young in that day. Is it, maybe the, the key is found in chapter 24, where Abraham is old, he says he's old, but he's still got so, some, you know, some time left here. And Adonai had blessed Abraham in everything he did. And he said to his servant who served him the longest, who was in charge of all he owned, it's believed that's Eliezer. It is not mentioned by name. It is assumed. He tells him to, to make an oath and to go back to the land of, of, uh, of his ancestry to his father's house and to get a bride for Isaac. Here's the point. Was Abraham not, okay, when he takes Isaac to the mountain, Isaac is probably somewhere around 30 years old. Now, even today, to be 30 years old and not be married is kind of unusual. You know, most people somewhere in their 20s, some a little bit younger, start thinking about this and, you know, we'll, we'll find someone, get married, and sometimes live happily ever after, other times not. But he's 30 years old. Now, in that day, it was not like it is today that the, the, the father would go out and find a bride for the son, and it was arranged marriages. So was, was Abraham kind of slacking in his responsibility to carry on the genealogy and the covenant and the promise? Was he enjoying his time with Isaac and like, okay, well, we'll get around to that one of these days? And so when Sarah dies... It's a wake-up call to Abraham that I need to get more involved in this. I need to, here we go, I need to be more involved in the establishment of the covenant. I, I taught the, the message that is available uh, through our website this month for those of you that, uh, that helped support us. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. The word there in, uh, in, in Greek, we look over in uh, the book of Matthew, he who endures to the end will be redeemed. Well, if we take that word and we trace it back into Hebrew, there's a couple of different words that are associated with the word endure. One of those is the same word that is spoken to Noah when he is told, I will... I am doing this, I'm going to establish my covenant with you. I believe the word is kom. I will establish my covenant with you, Noah. You're, you're going to be significant in my covenant going forth into other generations. It's possible, it's the same word over there in Matthew 24, that those who are actively involved in the establishing of the covenant from generation to generation shall be redeemed. It's an interesting one to think about. So it could have been a wake-up call, and he sends his servant to his father's house, doesn't want this kid getting married to those that are around, at least stay you know, somewhere in the bloodline here. And instead of this pagan uh, stuff that surround him, so he sends him, and we see this infamous you know, meeting at the well, which is kind of a theme of scripture, is it not? I mean, how many you know, Abraham, Abram at the time, and Sarah, they met at a well. They were they grew up in the same place, they grew up in the same family. They were playing at a well when they were little children. And, and, and consider this, that when did they get married? Let's say that you know, maybe 
they got married when, you know, Sarah's like, you know, 20 years old, okay? So they celebrated their 107th wedding anniversary. Oy vey. I mean, that's, that's a lot of anniversary. What do you do for your 100th wedding anniversary? Okay, where do you, what trip do you take on that one, all right? Uh, another subject. So I, d I doubt that any of us will have to deal with that. So here we see that uh, another barren woman at a well. She, uh, the, the servant, Eliezer, possibly doesn't know that she's barren, but they'll find out later. And this will go on through to other generations, even to the woman at uh, the Samaritan woman. When in John chapter 4, a barren woman that meets Messiah, Isaac is a type and shadow of Messiah, uh, the servant is a type and shadow of the Ruach HaKodesh. I mean, the, the pictures are right here in front of us for, I mean, it just doesn't take much of a stretch of my imagination to see that there is something being painted that is a very real uh, picture of the Messiah to be revealed, okay? Now, it is through that place, I want to spend some time here, it is through the meeting at the well that we enter in another individual, all right? And this is in chapter 24, verse 29. Rivka had a brother named Laban. All right, here we go. Mr. Laban. Well, we get an insight into this guy's life and who this person is by the next words after his name. And then I'll get to his name for a few moments. When he saw the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's wrists beside, and he heard his sister's Rivka's report, on and on and on and on from there, what does he say? Come on in. Hey, I see... Ka-ching, ka-ching. I see dollars to be made, and I am going to see what I can do to get a few of those out of your pocket and into mine. Because behind you is somebody that's very, very wealthy, and you know, I'm just not beyond the possibility of doing whatever I have to do to make sure that this is a good transaction for me. He would have made a very good presidential candidate, wouldn't he? Okay, I did, I did, did I really say that? Yes, I did. Okay, um, the name Laban, I just threw that one out. The name Laban, it means white. Okay, so when the servant sees uh, Laban and is introduced, hi, you know, I'm, I'm Abram's servant. I'm in charge of everything. Hi, my name is Purity. Uh, my name is Set Apart. My name is Holiness. My name is, you can trust me with everything you got. And then, let's look at the Hebrew there a little bit. It's, it's a, a, a Lamed, a Beit, and a final noon. So we have a, the Lamed is a, a shepherd's staff. It's the, the letter uh, that is associated with Malek, uh, the letter of the king. Okay? Then the, the bait is a house. And then the noon, a final noon, it's about sprouting life, life sprouting forward. So, I mean, everything, this, this guy is, this is the real deal. This guy is exactly what, you know, where I need to be. And I can trust him with everything. This is amazing. Uh, and then we see, who Laban really is in the end. If this is a, an end times prophecy being portrayed here, uh, not only about, you know, the, 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 about Isaac, about Messiah uh, coming, but the return to bring forth a bride in these last days, then 
should we also figure that there is going to be times that we see some Levans, Lavens, and that in this day, we need to make sure that we are discerning what is truth from what looks like truth. Matthew chapter 24. Go back and read it. And it, it says, when you see all these things, you know, read, read the chapter on your own. <clears throat> What's the first thing that Messiah says to these disciples concerning the last days? It is, he does not tell them about stocking up on beans, bullets, band-aids, and Bibles. Not necessarily in that order. And nothing wrong with that, okay? As long as our trust is in the right place, I think it's probably a very good idea right now. Yeah, very good. For those of you that have, uh, have, have been, have kind of gotten into this electronic rut, that everything that you do uh, regarding the scripture is on your computer, your phone, your pad, um, <clears throat> you know, whatever it is, it might just be a good time to go back and get associated with the hard copy. Just say it. Maybe a good time to stock up on a few things. In fact, if you haven't started to do that already, I would have to ask you, why didn't you? I mean, you know, look at what's been happening for the last years, okay? Um, but it says the number one thing, don't let anybody deceive you. Because there will be lavens. Those who have, have come to merchandise, Merchandise political systems? Well, that, that, I mean, could that ever be, could, could that ever be happening today you know, around us? Oh, no, never. Yeah, everywhere you look. Merchandising religious systems? Yeah. I, mean, I, I follow occasionally some of the YouTube stuff. Uh, you know, sometimes it's kind of fun to watch as the dreams and visions. And, and by the way, let me uh, let me let me preface something there. I'm I'm not talking about Dana Coverstone. I know a lot of people have been following the dreams that he had. Um, you know, we're, we're yet to see where that really goes. This is not a statement against him specifically, but there, there's a lot of people that are you know have these. You know, I had the latest greatest dream and the latest greatest vision. And God spoke to me last night. In fact, he, you know, I, I did like a little trip, like Mohammed, you know, to the heavens. And, oh, wait a minute, maybe not Mohammed. <laughs> maybe it was. Maybe it was the same thing. Looking for some golden tablets. Yeah, to where we can have another Bible, you know, a little extra added on and add to it. Yeah. And by the way, at the end of the video, I got a book written. I wrote it last night. Yeah, it's already published. Send your money right here, BR549. Some of you know what I just said. Others have no clue, okay? Um, Laven, is it possible that there is truth that is not truth? Think about that one. Is there truth that is not truth? Is there truth that is not his truth? Okay. What's that called? It's called deception. Is it, is there white that's not white? It says of Lucifer, Hasatan, Satan, he comes as an angel of light. White. So light is white, right? Unless you have LEDs now and you can make it any color you want. But he comes as an angel 
of Levant. And we must be discerning of truth today. I listen to probably like most of us, you know, I mean, I, I don't, I try not to be totally engulfed in it these days, but I listen to, to, to talk radio and there's a couple of people that I, I, I like that I, I, I listen to. There's one that, and I, you guys, some of you know, I've talked about him numerous times here. There's one person I listen to that I really listen to him not for, not to find truth from him, but just to see what he's saying. Because I personally believe that this person has some, some connections in some realms that may not be exactly as truthful as is portrayed. Um, Glenn Beck. Now, I, I know that some of you are probably going to get mad at me for what I'm about to say, but that's okay. All right. Glenn Beck has done, and this goes along with the deception that I'm talking about, Levon. Glenn Beck has single-handedly made Mormonism just another form of Christianity in many people's minds. Um, he is has been he has stood next to very famous rabbis. He's stood. Fe, uh, next to many famous uh, messianic leaders or, or so-called leaders. He has stood next to many Christian pastors. He would, be in, he would be welcome in most churches today. Many churches, many of the, the mega churches, would, uh, many of them would fully embrace him and would allow him to come up on the platform and at least say a few words to the congregation. But, uh, so Mormonism is being portrayed today as just another form of Christianity. I'd like to say to you that that is a Levon. That is a deception. that Mormonism is not. In fact, we could look at it as he comes as an angel of light. Okay? If you've ever studied Moroni and all these kind of things, if you've ever studied the, the, the origins, that Mormonism is, does not teach the Scripture. It teaches the Book of Mormon which contradicts the scripture. Now, why am I bringing this out? Because the other day, Mr. Beck uh, tipped his hand. I don't have anything against this man personally. Believe me, I, it's, that's irrelevant. This is not a personality issue. But Mr. Beck tipped his hand the other day a little bit, and he said, in our faith, we believe that there was a war in the heavens. Okay, now this was begun by him talking about put on the, the whole armor of God and the gospel and all these things. And then he says that we believe in our faith, Mormonism, that there was a war in the heavens and a third of the angels fell and were sent to this earth and we are those angels here to be redeemed. Is, is that... Does, does that line up with this book? I believe not. Does the statement that, um, that is made in Mormonism, that as, let me get this, get this right, as God is, man once was, as man is, or as God is, man will one day be, I think that's close to right there. Is, is that what's taught? in this book that Lucifer and Yeshua were, were brothers is, is that what's taught in this book but yet there are many people that are being deceived they're being deceived in this day because they're looking in a fa the face of a Levon 
and not seeing what the real truth is. And that's just one instance that is out there. There are many other areas today of deception that is happening. One of those is over in Matthew chapter, or Matthew, Genesis 25, in verse 5, Avraham gave everything he owned to Esau. Now, if we look at the Quran, okay, bring in another false religion. Uh, and, and, and by the way, if, if you think that Islam has kind of gone away and is, you know, well, that's just old news and we don't need to, to be concerned about that anymore. Yeah. Uh, you, you need to get a life here, okay? Because it hasn't gone anywhere. It's still there and is very real and will continue to be very real in days ahead. Uh, not speaking prophetically, it's just what I believe we're going to have to deal with. It's happening all over Europe, and there's probably coming a time in other countries, including the United States, that uh, it's going to have to be, it's going to be a reality again. We could probably go back and talk about Antifa and various things and find and, and see that there is some connections there, in fact. I won't go there. Uh, the Quran speaks, basically, of the, uh, it's, a, it's a counterfeit of Scripture. So, in the Scripture, we see in the Torah that Abraham has two sons. He has Isaac and Ishmael. And we read that the covenant is passed on. Take your son, your only son, Isaac, to the mountain, and then everything is given to him. Well, in the Quran, it's just the opposite, that everything is given to Ishmael. And so the war that's happening continual, and it's, it's kind of fascinating if you, if you stop and think about it for a moment, that three areas that are very hotly contested today are Hebron, the Temple Mount, and Shem, the place of the, the bones, the grave of Joseph. Those are some of the most hotly contested, fought over areas of all of Israel. Why? Because Abraham gave those areas and everything else that he had to Isaac, but yet Ishmael is trying to usurp the authority and the possessions that were given to Isaac. You know, it says that he sent, um, goes on and he says, and um, yeah, there it is, and he continued to make grants while he was living to those to the rest of his sons. Because I mean, when he married Keturah, here he is. I mean, this guy is you know, upwards of 137 years old, and uh, Keturah must have been a, a pretty young thing, maybe. And so they start having children, and he he made some grants. He gave them as as well as Ishmael. We see with Hagar. When's the last time that you you saw? The descendants of Isaac, the Jews, the, let's go to modern day, uh, modern day, the, the descendants of Isaac, Israel as a nation today. When's the last time you saw them attack Dubai or, you know, or, or, or somewhere in Iraq or, you know, or Babylon or uh, when's the last time they, they attack someone to get land? No, they've only, they've only taken land when they've been attacked. So there's a spiritual dynamic here that Ishmael will always be the wild donkey. Ishmael will always be the one that is trying to usurp authority and is sporting with the descendants of Isaac. This began here, and it is continuing on to our day. 
what we need to be very, very cautious of today is that we're not deceived by lavens in our life. There's going to be lavens. In fact, if the prophecy lines out, it is, <laughs> this, this, this may be a little bit above uh, where, where a few people want to go, but if the prophecy is, the picture is being painted of, of Isaac being a picture of the Messiah, of the bride, okay, and of the spirit of the servant be, being Eliezer, uh, then it is actually the spirit that brought him to this place to meet Laban. Can, can the spirit bring us to a place to test us of whether we will continue to rely on him for discernment or not? I mean, these are some questions I'm not going to have answers to really, but I want, to, I want you to consider that is it possible that events that are happening around us are there to test whether we will follow our maybe our own desires at times or we will follow what his desire is. What should have been done with Laban? Should Laban have gone back to, 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 uh, uh, to Abraham and said, okay, you know, I got this bride, but let me tell you about the guy that's there. Let me tell you, you should never send anybody else from this family line back there because there's a guy that he looks good on the outside, but inward is he's like a whitewashed tomb. Should we be looking for Laban's? Should we be discerning in our day? Yeah, I think so. I think absolutely so. Now, um, as we continue through these Torah portions, we're going to see some things that are going to, I, you know, when we get through, we're, we're in Isaac and, and, uh, and Jacob, then we get to Joseph, okay? Now that's the part of the book of, of, of Genesis of Bereshit that I love because I see it, I see these things that are happening in front of us. I said to somebody last week, uh, let me kind of just, I got to finish up here. I was with uh, a group the other day and they, they, we were talking about the elections and all this. And it was in the midst of a Torah study. I said, well, you know, I, I do find it interesting that, the, that this Torah portion that was read during the elections was the Torah portion of Sodom and Gomorrah. And I, I thought the person was going to flip out. One of the people that was there was going to flip out. Was, oh, yeah, whatever. Uh, it totally turned me off. Folks, don't discount. Don't discount that the one who declared the end out of the beginning lined up the Torah portions with world events? Or did he line up world events with Torah portions? Or is the answer yes? And that what we're reading on a weekly basis is what's happening in the spiritual realm around us. We'll see. Shavuot Tov. Have a blessed, prosperous week. Bezrat Hashem, God willing. Uh, see you again next week. And until then, as always, especially in these days, be strong, be engaged, and don't just exist. Let's flourish in these days. If you got to, reach up. Reach up. There is life that, uh, as it said, Look up for your redemption draws near. Adonai <laughs> Ye 
Shalom.